what's good, CCS family, because our guest returning to the Chris Collins Show, Millennial Talk Show, is CEO of Praxis, Cameron Soresby, joining us live on the Chris Collins Show, Millennial Talk Show. How's it going, fam? Good, Chris. How you doing? Hey, we're doing real, real good, my man. And Cameron, let's break the ice. I mean, we were just talking in our hashtag TLDR. Um, we might as well ask you right now at the top of the show. Off I the mean, bat, right away. Right off the bat. I mean, <laughs> would you rather see your students go to vocational school or become a millennial mobster? I mean, it seems like, you know, a lot of people think there's options out there. <laughs> millennial mobster sounds like a much cooler career path than than vocational school to me. Does that sound I, like a lot of a cooler path than what I most think you could open up like a branch. You could totally have like, hey, you could either learn about IT and computers or you can learn about millennial mobster and how to stay out of jail. Fair enough. I mean, Cameron Soresby has spoken. <laughs> but for the listeners who missed your first appearance on the Chris Collins Show, tell us what Praxis is all about. Give us an update and has anything changed? Absolutely. So Praxis, it's a one-year apprenticeship program. Simply, we are focused on helping hardworking, ambitious young people start their career strong and, you know, long-term build, build careers that they love. And the program, uh, our participants, they go through a three-month professional development boot camp where they kind of start developing and building in-demand valuable skills, discover what kinds of careers they're actually interested in. Uh, then they spend three months working with our job placement team to land a really awesome, like, first career opportunity. And then in the first six months working full time, they're going through um, workshops and they have coaching access. And uh, we, we have 96% full time employment at growing businesses wow. all across the country by the time they graduate. Are you guys starting to see an uptick in enrollment because of this most recent COVID-19 pandemic? Oh, yeah. I, I look at the past, you know, we're, we're coming off on 19, 20 months now of dealing with COVID and within the higher education space, it feels like it has just accelerated existing trends probably by a decade. So wow. starting starting like late spring semester back in 2020, that's where we started to get a lot more interest coming from students that were in college and were just having a terrible experience as you know colleges you know, we're transitioning to like Zoom classes and everything. And I think it, it woke a lot of people up to like, wait a second, like, what am I actually paying for? Right. And they just weren't having great experience. So like customer experience is declining. The cost of the product of college is increasing or, or staying the same. And so that, that really made people question, I think, through between then and then like the first six months where it was clear, like this thing isn't going to go away anytime soon. There's just more and more people uh, seeking college alternatives. Like when we look just beyond our program itself, which we've probably grown 10, 20% just wow. based off of COVID, you know, related issues and stuff. When we look at like search terms for college alternatives, they've like, increased by like 500 percent over the past 18 years. i mean that that's so true cameron because you know students throughout the nation are feeling the effects of covid 19 as the pandemic has seen a rise in homeschooling because of what you just mentioned remote learning and what do we need our children to learn to become successful in the 21st century i i mean if you're if you're talking about kids you know before they enter high school phase i i honestly think the biggest thing parents should be thinking about is like, how can I get my kid interested in learning itself? And the best way to do that is kind of allow them to have some control and agency over that process. And I think, you know, we have probably 30, 35% of our participants were homeschooled growing mm -hmm. up, at least partially. And at 18, 19, 20, they're usually in a much better position to start their careers because they, they have a sense of, you know, maturity and self-directedness, whereas people that are like really take on the core habits of like what it means to be schooled, they're waiting for someone to tell them what to do. And no one's going to tell you how to build, like how to start building the life that they, that you want. So the more influence you can give your kids over what they get to study, even if it's just like, 
hey, instead of loading them up with extracurriculars after school and your entire schedule is, is filled up, like let them decide what they want to do a little bit. And, and, you know, they'll, they'll kind of build that muscle over time, but we've, the, the more mature and responsible and, and someone that's capable of deciding for themselves what they want to spend their time on, the more successful they'll be in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. And I know it wasn't just the move from the classrooms to the computer screens that's really changed everything. I mean, it really tested the basic ideas of instruction, attendance, testing. That's just a few things I can think of right now. But yeah. Are there other things that I'm missing that the pandemic is reshaping education that's on your mind right now, Cameron? I mean, I think the a big trend that was already there over the past decade is the question of like within college, does it actually have the long term benefit of like employment rates, earning, earning potential, et cetera? Uh, in 2020, co like college graduates of 2020, so we're 18, 19 months into this, they are still 45%, 45% of them are still looking for long-term employment opportunities. Yeah. So their college is not preparing young people to, you know, to be successful. Absolutely not. I can think 100%. of a few of my own good <laughs> friends who have engineering degrees, but still work 100%. factory jobs. I mean, I don't understand that. And Cameron, all we've heard in the last 20 years is that the system isn't working and it's very costly causing student loan debt and no one is coming up with a solution. So how do we educate the next generation? I mean, I think it's already happening. I think there, there are more alternatives every year popping up, both in K through 12 education as well as higher education. Um, but you know, it's you're coming up against a against decades of conformity, essentially, where it's like you expect to go to school, you're expected to go to you know your good public or private school, K through 12, and then that leads to college, etc. I think that the biggest thing that needs to happen and you know continue to happen is just you know, as, as a family unit, thinking through like, what is the best form of education for us, as opposed to approaching everything as like, how are we going to solve education at the societal level? You're not going to have control over that. You can only make decisions for, for you and, you know, your family. Um, and that's how we approach it at practice. Like, I care deeply about you know, education, professional development, helping young people start their careers. I can't worry about what is going on at the societal level. I started, you know, a business to, to work in this area. And it's like, hey, I want Praxis to be the best product possible for our customers. And I want to, you know, grow it long term. So it is I think interesting. It, it has to start at that individual level. I don't mean to cut you off camera, but it is okay. interesting that you do say at the societal level, because my next follow up question to you was, you know, our nation is facing a labor shortage throughout America. And what's going to motivate the next generation to get educated? I mean, yeah, I it think, seems like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I think there's a disconnect between education and success in the real world not not just like career success but like building the the personal and professional life that leads to fulfillment and an individual you know happiness success whatever and i think the average person looks at school k through 12 college etc and they see it as a series of obligations in order to just get a ticket to like being successful as an adult. Like I have to do those things. I remember in college myself, like it felt like 80% of my classroom were kids in pajamas hung over from the parties <laughs> before. Like you didn't get a sense. A lot of people wanted yeah. to show up to class every day. And uh, you know, if, if that happens on a long enough timeline, like of course education is going to be broken, you know, but I think again, like, there's more access to educational resources and opportunities now more than ever. I think the next step is focusing on outcomes that you're trying to produce. So like at Praxis, like we're, our specific goals, like help you get your career started, land a full-time paid job at a growing business. You have to tie things that people are doing on a day-to-day -day basis educationally to be like, what is the actual outcome you're trying to produce for yourself? 
Right, and Cameron, let's shift gears for a moment, because when it comes to praxis, I mean, do you think your institution is in a new chapter of education when it comes to students feeling that they're not learning anything during their first two years in college? I mean, I, I think what we hear all the time from, from applicants, you know, in the, uh, in the application process is that the ones that went to, went to college after high school and then now they're dropping out and looking at programs like Praxis is the first two years of college just felt like more like co or more like high school. Yeah, but right. Now, yeah. <laughs> now I'm paying twenty to fifty thousand dollars a year for that. Absolutely. And I mean, do you think there's an opportunity to reimagine what schools will look like? Yeah, I mean, I again, like I think it's happening now. Like obviously what we're doing, there's more like skill-based programs popping up, like there's coding boot camps and sales boot camps. Most of those are a little bit more geared towards individuals that are already in their career and trying to transition. But I think there's going to be a natural cascading effect where it's like in 10 years from now, it's absolutely going to be common for people to just enter, you know, you know start, start living as an adult and it's going to be like niche, training programs, educational programs based on those interests, as opposed to looking at this behemoth of college of, hey, you have to make this six figure, four to right. six year investment up front in order to, you know, even have a possibility of being successful. Um, and, and we're seeing it in generations. Like when we started Praxis in 2014, there was a lot of skepticism, not just because we're a brand new company back then, but you know, individuals and parents are just so, you know, they're, they've been told over and over, like, you have to go to college. Right. Now we have probably more than half of our, like, inbound interests are parents of teenagers thinking through, like, hey, like, I have all that, like, as a parent, I've been stuck with student debt for 20 years. I don't want to put my kid in that same position. What other options are out there and stuff? And when I talk right. to Gen Z, like, all of our applicants are Gen Z now, uh, which is crazy to think about. You know, when I see those like birth years of 2003 for the program, it makes me feel extremely old. Um, but they're like, they are so, they're almost nonchalant about the, the decision to go to college. They're like, hmm. yeah, it just seems expensive and a lot of time, like, I'd rather just get started now. Well, Whereas, maybe they're seeing through the the foggy mirror. Like, you know, it's yeah. it's like you you referenced. I mean, it's the credentialism. I mean, it's like the last prejudice on our generation. I mean, it's like if yeah. you don't get that Willy Wonka golden ticket, you're not going to get a job in life. And is that really the case, Cameron? I mean, does America hate the poorly educated? That's what I'm starting to feel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think... I think they get the definition wrong of what being well-educated versus poorly educated actually is. They, they focus on those credentials and everything. Um, but I, I mean, there's opportunities everywhere. Like the companies that we work with in our network that, that hire our participants, these, are, these aren't like podunk small mom and pop businesses in you know, the middle of nowhere, et cetera. These are you know, tech thriving, tech right. companies, growing businesses, et cetera. I've talked to over 500 hiring manager CEOs at these companies. There's only been two times where the conversation stopped because it's sorry, we don't hire people without college degrees. Mm. Two out on of that, over 500. Yeah, and on that note, what would you say to first generation students? So you have, and that's what I teach mostly at Cal State LA. So what would you have them, like what message could you give to them if they want to go to a program like Praxis? They looked at the numbers, um, financially it makes sense, here's more opportunities, I gravitate to it, but their family who has never been to college and has hung this like golden ribbon on a college degree, what could they say to their parents to help ease their mind? I mean, now we have the, you know, the, the credibility and the reputation of the outcomes we've produced. So like, specifically Praxis is an easier sell to make to like your skeptical parents than, than it used to be for sure. Um, I, I think what I've seen part to like applicants to Praxis do really well is put in the work and do your own research, do your homework and make the case like to if, if it's important to you to have your family support with with your education decision, 
show them that you have put in the work and the research and the homework to be like, hey, like I'm breaking down college versus praxis or college versus something else I would do. Here are the pros and cons to it. I'm treating this decision seriously as opposed to like the stereotypical impression, you know, young adults can give off of like, oh, I don't want to do all the work that comes with college. I just want to take the easy route to something. Like, I think just- Take control of your destiny. Yeah, taking control. And then Mm -hmm. frankly, I would tell somebody like ultimately, you know, it's up to your own comfort level and your preference here. But at some point you're going to have to take control and take responsibility for your own life. And you can't just, you know, have to get your permission, you know, have to have permission from, your mom and dad from your family right. to do what you want to do. And that can be super tough, especially at that, you know, transition age, 18 to 22, et cetera. But the sooner you can really start treating yourself as a, you know, an independent adult, the, the better off you're going to be. And the quicker off, the quicker you're going to get to the point where your family is in a position where it's like, Hey, this person's clearly showing a, a sense of independence and maturity I know I can back off and, right. and not like break down that relationship or, or something like that. And Cameron, I did want to kind of switch it to uh, current events that are happening this week, obviously, because we have a, a, a moving infrastructure bill that's worth $3.5 trillion, which no one really knows what's in it, but they want to support two free years of college. And honestly, being in college and grad school for eight straight years, I don't know what two free years of community college will do for our nation truthfully just like how we spoke you're taking like two years of remaking or retaking high school classes all over again like what does that serve for anybody so why not invest through k-12 through education i mean we, we spent a bunch of money in k-12 through as well I, I don't know if more more money is going to be the or answer, i guess but... the real question that i should yeah. be uh saying to you is should we uh as our nation reconsider shifting the focus away from college as the end game when it comes to, let's say high school guidance counselors. Yeah, I think, yeah. So with guidance counselors, it's really cool. We actually, over the last few years, we've seen the trend with guidance counselors of like, they're kind of getting fed up and they're, they're like having moral quandaries over just like pushing college on all of their students and we've, we've had more guidance counselors reaching out to practice and be like, hey, I'm trying to collect as much information on alternatives to college just so I have more options to share with my students. So I think there's, there's some promising signs there. Obviously, like they're part of the system and that's, you know, college is what they know and they're kind of incentivized due to the nature of their job to just like kind of push, co- like they're essentially there to help their students get accepted into college. Absolutely. Um, so, so the fact that there are more and more counselors like seeking alternative options, like I think that's a really promising side, promising sign of where we're going socially with like the acceptance of college versus other options and stuff. And then the one point I'll make about uh, community college and it being free, like as an individual making that decision, there's nothing free about spending two years of your time on anything. Mm, that's, you know, your, your time is more point. valuable than, you know, what, you know, the conservative, you know, tuition could be for a community college. So, so keep that in mind. It might be sold to you as like, oh, this is free. This is guaranteed to be a good thing. Like consider your options and are you going to be better off two years down the road? Absolutely, Cameron. And, you know, we don't need a Ouija board, you know, to speculate on the future of higher education as we could see it unfold before our eyes as new education providers outside of higher education, such as Praxis, are shaping how we do business. And with that being said, Harvard University President Lawrence Bacow recently said that higher education will incrementally adapt to changing conditions as it historically has, maintaining its current mission and structure, while meanwhile they are approaching uh, new ideas to tuition pricing. For example, they want to do subscriptions or offering the same program as a traditional institutions at a far lower prices have emerged. I'm already starting to see a smirk on you, Cameron. You're starting to make me laugh already. But what does that say about the future of higher education? Because, you know, we see universities. They're built like palaces and financers, you know, have made fortunes in part through a lie. I mean, what's your thoughts on all this? 
I, I mean, you think about typical universities and, and academic types, historically, they haven't been the types to be like, oh yeah, like college could be better in so many ways. We're working on it. You know, we're trying to be as innovative as possible. They've been more stubborn about like, no, this is a historical institution. It's, it's always good for you, et cetera. So the fact that they're starting to change their talking points to like, of course we're going to innovate and get better with the times. Like, I think that tells you they're, they're starting to feel the pressure. Um, yeah. Like what am I supposed to be in like week eight of the semester? And all they're like, Hey, we need your monthly subscription payment to right. still be in the classroom. Like, are, are you kidding me? Like, do I really need that stress when I'm supposed to be turning in a 10 to 15 page write up? <laughs> it sounds crazy. Hey, Cameron, the reason I mentioned this was because the U S department of education announced major changes Wednesday to a federal student loan forgiveness program that the agency says could bring relief to more than 550,000 borrowers working in government and nonprofit sectors. But my question to you is this, what solutions should President Joe Biden consider when it comes to fixing student loan forgiveness? Because let me just give you a little bit of a backstory. Now, you might have heard this from high school students and even the Gen Z today, but like I attended Claremont High School, not too far away from this studio right now, nearly a decade ago. And I never learned once in the classroom about student loan forgiveness and student loan repayment options that I had available to me. And one of the biggest takeaways that I get that I love Ben Shapiro's point because he always says there's transparency and education is essential. And why are we lending out loans to students who clearly can't pay their loans when themselves, including their parents' adjusted gross income doesn't suffice? I mean, what? it's I mean, crazy. It, it, it's crazy because on one side you hear, you know, college graduates have, you know, they earn over a million more dollars throughout the lifetime of their career than non-college graduates. It's a no brainer financial decision. And then on the other end, we're having this huge conversation about student debt relief because, you know, stu you know, graduate college graduates can't pay off their debt because they're not making enough money. Right. Like that, those, those two things don't add up. Um, as far as policy, I would, I would say stop subsidizing these student loans and, and allow colleges to compete in the free market with all of these more innovative alternatives popping up. You know, right. They're, they're being sheltered, they're being protected through the government. And it's this, you know, because you can get a student loan, you can't, as an 18 year old, you go to a bank and ask for a 50,000 loan to start a business. You're not, they're gonna be laughed out of the bank. Right. Um, whereas college is like no one bats an eye when you know, you, you invest, you know, six figures in, into a college education. So it's got to stop at the, at the source rather than, you know, putting band-aids through, you know, student debt relief. And there's also that uh, point as well, like what you guys always push forward. And that's why I love having Praxis on. I think you guys are a, a, a God saint to this, this generation because we really need alternative options. And I'm glad that you are the man in charge to make this happen. But, you know, you're talking about that career. And, you know, we're always talking about, we were just joking like five minutes ago, you know, we all know peers that have college degrees who aren't making anything happen. And why isn't that being implemented, let's say, in the classroom? Because every high school and college has a career center. But I would bet my life savings that a majority of the students don't visit these facilities. So this is like wasted money. How do we fix this problem in these palaces that we call universities? <laughs> uh, frankly, like if you're relying on the ac an academic institution to help you figure out how to build your career and land jobs, like in the business world, in the professional world, you're not going to have a great time. Mm. And you know, the, the sooner you realize like, hey, I wouldn't go to like, I, I know like those buildings have career center. I wouldn't go, I wouldn't step foot in that. I would, I would <laughs> seek out advice and mentorship from successful professionals that I want to replicate myself. So you're basically saying the career centers that are happening on colleges are just not happening. They're not working. And why, you know, even though we only have like 15 fire. seconds. <laughs> oh man. I, of money. 
Right. And man, I wish I had way more time with you, Cameron. I could be talking yes. with you for another 25 minutes, but I do want to do my due diligence because I know there's a listener out there that might be curious about what Praxis is all about and how can they find you online and where can they follow you on social media to get even more detail about enrolling into Praxis. So the website is discoverpraxis.com. You can start an application or download our program guide or, or schedule a call with a rep to learn more. And you can follow Discover Praxis on Instagram. That's the best place. Cameron Sorsby, awesome. you, you are Cameron. amazing, my man. And, you know, much success. And I, like I said, you guys are a godsend to this nation. Uh, much success moving forward. And thank you again for returning to the Chris Collins Show Millennial Talk Show.